All right, I think we are live, so let me just go ahead and start. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Astro Coffee Hangout, a place where all the cool kids hang out every other week to discuss the latest amazing discoveries in the world of astronomy. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and today we are talking with members of a team from, of researchers from Yale University who have discovered that compact multiple planet systems are more likely to form around stars that have lower amounts of heli heavy elements uh, than our sun. Than our, the heavier elements than our sun does. And this runs counter to a good deal of current research, which has focused on stars with much higher metallicity. Now, metallicity to astronomers means that are any elements heavier than helium. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because, you know, come on, that's weird. It's not a metal, but yeah, it kind of is. So we'll sort that out here today. The research team looked at 700 stars and their surrounding planets for the study, which appears in the Astrophysical Journals, uh, le uh, Journal, uh, <laughs> from the Astronomical, the American Astronomical Society. We'll talk about them, too, in just a second. So before we get started, let me just point out that we are streaming, I hope, on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. And we want to hear your questions and comments for these guys because this is your chance to interact with professional astronomers. So I hope you guys will make use of this resource. So, okay, let me bring up my my friends and co-host right in the sort of astronomical Brady Bunch panel we have here uh, below me. Here's a story of a lovely lady. As, uh, there she is, Carol Christian from the Center for <laughs> Emerging Media. Hi, Carol. Welcome. And you want to introduce our little Astro Coffee concept to people and also thank our sponsors. Sure. So um, you can see that winter is about to <laughs> onslaught where I live. <laughs> and yeah, you look you know, I don't. I don't like winter. <clears throat> anyway, um, yes, a a afternoon astronomy coffee was invented as an extension to what goes on in our research institutions and university departments in many sciences in many fields. And the idea is you have an informal coffee chat about the latest research um, that you've heard about. And if there happens to be a colloquium speaker or two in the vicinity visiting your institution, you invite them and you try to get some of the behind the scenes information about their research, um, what they think about, you know, the other research in that field and how they arrived at the discoveries that they have, you know, what the method is, what telescope was used, things like that. So we thought, wouldn't it be great to invite people into our afternoon coffee and talk with the researchers about what they're doing? And we picked these topics from um, the literature, the refereed literature, the science literature. Um, also, we have a nice thing called the American Astronomical Society tip sheet. And also there is a group of young astronomers who publish um, AAS NOVA. And all of that references the American Astronomical Society, uh, which is our professional organization for astronomers. And uh, they do, they are responsible for some of the referee journals that we use to publish our results. They also are responsible for coordinating um, career paths, jobs, things like that in, in our profession and people related to our profession like uh, data assistants, um, engineers, things like that. Uh, the other organization that sponsors us is the American Astronautical Society, which is a society of engineers. So we thank them for their support, and uh, we're really glad that our researchers were able to join us today for an informal chat about their research. That's right. It's it's geekiness no matter where you go, whether you're an, whether <laughs> yeah, an engineer yeah, yeah. or astronomer, <laughs> we're all the same. We we just like to talk about this stuff. Yes, and and terminology and acronym alert. You are, you many of you who follow us know that we have funny ways of naming things. Sometimes it's just what's ever convenient or whatever we thought of at the time, and so we have some terms like that related to this particular research as well. And so if you don't know them already, you will soon learn about it. <laughs> That's right. But all of it is in Whether an you like it or not. <laughs> That's right. But all of it is in an attempt to make you feel, to make you smarter, to make you feel better, to get to increase your vocabulary and learn <laughs> one more thing that you didn't know from yesterday. So here we go. Let me just introduce our guest. 
We've got Yale University here with us today, at least two people that, that are from the uh, University of Yale-ish. Um, <laughs> my first is, uh, is Dr. John Brewer. He is on the right right now, or he's over there. No, he's over there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hi, John. Welcome. Also, right hello. below him is uh, Song Wu Wong, from, also from Yale University. These guys wrote a paper. I want to tell you, though, I put a link in the description box on YouTube. I didn't get a chance to do it on Facebook yet, and I'll do it afterward, but there is a Google Drive link that you can go to download two papers. One of them is um, the paper we're going to talk about today, and another one is another one which they felt like they needed to have. So uh, they're both there for you to download to follow along. Uh, okay, so Let's talk first about. Oh, can I just once say one thing? And no, I remember. You've had your moment. This is yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that we're missing Deborah Fisher, who's part of the team, and uh, we're really sorry she couldn't join us because she's done some important work on this topic too. So, yeah. hey Deb, if you get to watch, this, we're sorry <laughs> yeah. we miss you. We do miss you. Of, you. of yeah. course, and you're of course welcome to come back at another time. Um, what? I want to start with meta, this idea of meta. Can I, let me just get the joke out of the way because Peter <laughs> Quinn has already been asking it. So he says, no Black Sabbath then. That's right. right. They do exactly. not like Ireland. <laughs> All right. So none of that. All right. Anyway, heavy metals uh, and exoplanets. Who? Which one of you wants to give us an overview, a sort of a summary of your research, and then we'll dive in? Uh, I can start there. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Um, so... Right, heavy heavy elements, heavy metals. Uh, you had already brought that up, which is astronomers kind of just recognize hydrogen, helium, and everything else. Uh, and for the everything else, we just used metals as a shorthand. Uh, and uh, in our paper, we actually used a metal. We used iron, uh, but we're using it as a proxy for the overall heavy element content. Uh, in the atmosphere of the star, and into I'm sorry, planet. Mike. I have to interrupt you. Uh, Song Hu, you're yep. in a you're in a high traffic area. I get that. Um, <laughs> I wonder if we could get you to just sort of push the talk when you're ready on your mic. Could you please uh, mute your okay. mic? Thank okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. but it's very it's getting very <laughs> distracting. He's in a high traffic area at lunchtime, folks. So please, you know, bear with him. It's he's on the he's on the <laughs> west coast right now. Thank you, Song Hu. And then when you need to talk, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, um, and so um, we had known for for since kind of the the very first few planets that were formed that stars with a heavy element, a higher heavy element content than the sun, tend to to make giant planets on short period orbits, what we call hot Jupiters. So there's another term for you, um, and we want to know. The rocky planets are much more interesting to us. Something that we found a lot with Kepler has been these compact multiple planet systems. So instead of our, like our system, we have uh, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Earth out to an AU. Inside, say, the orbit of Venus, these systems would have three to five to even seven planets. So uh, they're, they're really packed in close together. The planets are typically small. And in our paper, in our work, we found that at very low um, metallicities, uh, the fraction of planet hosts that, that are these compact multi-planet systems start increasing and increasing dramatically. So at about a, a third of the, the metallicity of the sun, uh, you've got... Uh, most of the planets being formed are in these systems. So stars like our sun, which has a higher level of metallicity than these stars you looked at, um, there, there's a lot more of these low metal stars with planets in systems like, you said, Mercury, Venus, and Earth out to 1 AU. So there's a, there's a dramatic difference in the number of these kinds of systems with around low metal stars, not high metal stars. Is that right? Right. So um, across most of the metal metallicity range that we looked at, we looked at stars with uh, about a third of the metallicity of the sun, all the way up to about three times the metallicity of the sun. Um, and uh, across most of that range, compact multi-planet systems make up about the same fraction of planet hosts uh, over that range. But at the lowest end, 
they start to increase and become the dominant type of planetary system. Okay, you said planetos? Uh, I didn't mean to. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, planetary system? Planetary system. Oh, okay, all right. I heard planetos, and I, was, I didn't know what that was, so I thought I better, <laughs> I better ask about that. Okay. Does that mean our sun is strange? That we, because we have these systems, we have these planets, and it's got a, it's relatively high metal content compared to these stars? Um, we just don't know yet. Yeah, so mainly we don't know. So uh, by what we've found so far, our system is strange. Uh, but that's mainly because we haven't had the capabilities of finding systems like ours yet. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, Song Hu, you, maybe you can comment, you guys talk a little bit about your method. You, you looked at 700 stars. Is that right? Yes. And, uh, can I, can I go back to the first question you asked? Oh, I, you I want to make, make it a, a little bit clear and, uh, in our solar system, the innermost planet is a Mercury, right? That's right. The, the Mer Mercury's orbit is about 88 days, and there is nothing within Mercury's orbit. But uh, surprisingly, most of planet we found orbiting other stars are very close to their sun. So we really don't know how did they form and how did they evolve so you're saying you don't have a sense of how they got there because they're closer, all the planets, than, than Mercury is to, to our sun. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so again, that's we're kind of weird. We've got these, these, these planets that are rocky, smaller, and further out around a higher metal star. Uh, and you're saying most of what you found, uh, they're all crammed really close in. You know, I've, I've been hearing about this a lot lately where <laughs> there are, um, where, where there are, uh, planets with orbits of like 11 hours or 10 days or whatever it is going on. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that the universe is getting to be kind of weird when it comes to exoplanets. So you're saying that of the ones that you looked at, they were, uh, in these really super tight orbits around the area of Mercury, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Within, within that, uh, most of them are within Mercury's orbits. And it's uh, the reason we start this, uh, the relation between the planet system and their uh, stellar property is that we really want to know what's the mechan mechanism behind these uh, planets, what's uh, make them form the there, yeah. or reach there, yeah. Yeah, I had talked to somebody from ESO earlier this week, and they were saying roughly the same thing. They want these spectrographs, or they have these high-resolution instruments that can look at solar activity on stars, magnetic magnetic fields, active regions, things like that, even stellar seismology, so that they can, they need to get a better handle on what these stars are like uh, that these planets are forming around. This is just, it sounds to me, another extension of that, where you guys are looking at the metal contents of these stars. Right. And actually, we, we, uh, we actually obtained high resolution spectra and got the abundances of not just iron, but 15 different elements. So, uh, and what was interesting is as we kind of expected the, um, the rock forming elements, uh, all had this similar pattern. So, um, oh. if, if, as you went to the lower overall content, uh, of heavy elements, uh, everything else, is decreasing in lockstep. So okay, that, well, I'm just gonna reason. I'm just gonna ask a naive, I won't say stupid question, but probably yeah. is. Uh, so, can aren't those kind of anti-correlated? If you've got low metal stars and it all forms out of the same protoplanetary disk, well, no, that wouldn't work because the sun would would. I'm just trying to go low metal in the stars. Well, maybe it's all in the planets, right? <laughs> uh, things like that. So, I guess that's a little naive, and it certainly isn't true for our own system. So. Right. So planets make up a, a really tiny fraction of the uh, overall mass that went into making up a okay. star. Sure, sure. So sure. for instance, uh, Jupiter is only about a thousandth the mass of the sun, and yet it's the biggest thing in the system. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, but we do expect that the whatever went into forming the star also went into forming the planets. Uh, the, the differentiation comes uh, when... Some elements condense out of the cloud first, uh, 
at higher temperatures. Those are the, what we consider rocks. Uh, some things stay gaseous uh, down to really, really cool temperatures. And so gases are harder to accrete until you can start gravitationally pulling them in. Once you have a really massive planet, you can start accreting gases. Okay. Uh, so I, I had a question. So these compact systems that you have singled out, do they also have Jovian and Neptunian size planets as well as small planets or no? Well, that's a good question. Mean, sorry. You mean in the same orbits or in the very long orbits? <laughs> in the same system somewhere. He wants to hedge. He's just setting it up. <laughs> I know. I got that. I figured that out. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to say. Most of uh, Jupiter-like, our own Jupiter-like planets, have a small planet within its orbit. But that's a for long period Jupiter. For short period Jupiter, most of them didn't have uh, neighbors. Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit for short period. This two population is uh, isolated with each other. Okay, so uh, give us a brief summary of your methodology, Songhu, about the stars you looked at and what data you took. We, you, 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 uh, Mike's mentioned briefly that you looked at other elements besides, I think it was like 15 other elements. Can you give us a brief summary of your methodology? Then I got a couple of questions I want to uh, get to from the audience. I think, I think John is the uh, best okay. person to, to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, I keep calling yeah. you Michael. Why? It's because I've got you as Michael Brewer. That's oh, a... it's John Michael Brewer. Oh, it's, oh, <laughs> okay. All right. So which do you want me to call you, John or Michael? Uh, John's fine. Okay, John. Of course, uh, because that's what I have. That's wrong. <laughs> what I have on the lower third. Okay, so John, go ahead. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, um, we uh, take high resolution spectra. All of these spectra were obtained uh, using the uh, Keck telescope in Hawaii uh, and the high resolution spectrograph called High Res. Um, we then. Um, we build a, a mathematical model, a, a physical model that uh, allows us to, to try and estimate the spectrum based on physical properties. So the temperature of the star, the gravity of the star, the composition of the star, the rotation of the star. Uh, and we do that repeatedly until we get a model that fits. Uh, so we get a spectrum that looks exactly like the spectrum we observe then we think we know what is in the star and what the star is made of. And that's an important, uh, that's an important way astronomers do research, isn't it? You guys make these models first that you understand because they're based on principles that you think are happening in the universe, right. in this case, star and planet formation. And uh, you then say, well, if we're right, then our model is showing us this. Let's go look for stuff out there that matches right. this, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, um, and so, so with that, we can get the compositions. And from that, we also, we've already found planets around all these stars. Uh, and so we can start looking for correlations between what we think we know the star is made of and what planets we found around it. And so in this case, we separated those into four categories. Three of them we plotted in, in our plots. Um, one of them is... I'm happy to put them up if you tell me which figure. Oh, sure. Uh, so in figure one, you can see the, um, the distributions of the, the three types of planets. So out of the 700 some odd uh, hosts, um, about 100 of them were hot Jupiters. So lonely giant planets close into their star. Lonely, as Song Hu was saying, because hot Jupiters tend not to have any Neighbor, nearby neighbors, um, cool Jupiter. So these are Jupiter. That's the blue line. Planets, uh, further out. Uh, that's the uh, green line. So the orange line is hot Jupiters. The green line is cool Jupiters, oh. and the blue line is um, is uh, compact multi-planet systems. And each of these lines is representing the ratio of that type of system to all the other. 600-ish uh, 
systems at a given metallicity. So you're seeing at, at some metallicity, say solar, pick zero there. Yeah. Uh, this one is at zero metallicity. That's... Um, the point on each of those lines is the relative um, um, probability of finding uh, that type of system uh, at that metallicity. And that's expressed in percent. So I would have a 0.5. It's, it's only expressed in percent if you integrate it under that curve. So it's a, oh. <laughs> it's not the easiest curve. To think that yeah. I'm trying to, way. I'm trying to picture what you're telling me. So at zero metallicity on, on iron versus helium ratio, uh, then the green line is going to a half or, or 0.5, 0.5 right. what density ratio. So, yeah. So it's a, um, it's a density. So if you were to take a, a instead of a, a single point, if you were to take a small little area, you add up the entire area under that, you'd get a percentage and that would be the probability and percentage. I see. Okay. Uh, but it's still useful to just look at the lines themselves because one thing you'll notice about the green and the orange line is that they kind of started about minus 0.2 and, and increase the whole way. Right. Uh, to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the blue line is roughly uh, level across most of it from about minus 0.2 all the way up to plus 0.4. There's some little bumps and wiggles, but we could call that flat. Uh, but below minus 0.2, all of a sudden it starts to increase and really at minus 0.3 to minus 0.5, it just shoots up to about a factor of three higher than it had been. So looking at that graph, it, it, is it the right impression that around slightly more than solar, they're all almost the same? Yeah. Uh, so you have mm, that's kind, interesting. Of, kind of an equal probability of finding any of those type of systems. Huh. That is interesting. So good. The, the, the real, the real meat here is this part of the graph here where you've got this big rise uh, yeah. in prob in the density ratio. That's really cool. Um, okay. Well, let me get to a question. Hang on. Let me, uh, uh, there was a good one that had, we were, when we were talking of, this is from Condor boss. Wait, can I, oh, sorry. Can I ask one more question? Sorry. Oh, sure, um, Carol. So if those are almost equal probability, that means that our solar system could have been any one of the three. It could have been, in fact, it could have also been one of the three that I didn't mention, which is something that wasn't one of those three. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, uh, never mind. <laughs> there's one of these found... three, and then there's not <laughs> one of these. <laughs> <three>. <laughs> okay, Cause, sorry, cause remember, sorry, Tony. Because <laughs> remember that those three only made up uh, three hundred yeah. of the seven hundred. <laughs> right, right. Okay, go ahead, Tony. All right. So I want to read Condor Boss's question. First of all, he made a comment about ABBA. And I just got to say, ABBA is not heavy metal. Okay. I, whatever, regardless <laughs> of how you feel about ABBA, I personally like ABBA, but uh, it's not heavy metal. I'm sorry. No matter how you look at that, I don't know how you make that into heavy metal. Okay. Condor, but he's also asking a really good question. Back to when you, we were talking about the uh, correlation between low metallicity and these high uh, rocky multi planet systems that are close into the star. He is asking, is that correlation a result of selection bias uh, in that the low metal stars have closer in planets? Is it a selection bias? The uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, that's a very good question. We when we wrote this paper, I discussed with John a lot about that, and we exclude nearly every kind of uh, observational bias, especially especially for the green line we showed here which agree with the previous results from a different paper as I showed before. So that's a strong evidence that this result is not biased. What I'm sorry, what is? What 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 graph are you referring to? I can put it. Yeah, so is, so I'm still talking about the first uh, figure, figure one. The, okay. The it's, figure one. It's back. But uh, but if you look at the hot Jupiter line. Okay. And that line agree with uh, figure five in another paper I show you. Okay, shall I put that up? Let me see if I sure. can. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Figure, I got to go way down. Figure five. You're on. This is live, folks. Here I am scrolling through a PDF <laughs> file. There it is. Figure five. Uh, it's in the. This is in the Fisher and Valenti paper. Uh, okay, I've got it up. Figure five. Yes, I and as you can see. The hot Jupiter line in our 
in our figure one agree with uh, this figure five. So this is a uh, strong evidence that our result is not biased. And fig figure five in Fisher Valenti's paper is uh, one of most important results from uh, in our field, and uh, it's uh, it's been confirmed many times with a different sample. Uh, okay, so and the different groups. You guys can't see what I'm doing, but I've got both papers up, and I've got the figure five right below figure one in your paper. And so you're saying that these lines are more or less the same. These plots from hot Jupiters to agree with this Fisher and Valenti paper, which you got to you got to give us the context for that plot, though. Is that for hot Jupiters? Yes, that's okay. for Jupiter, mainly hot Jupiters, but uh, oh, but also as you, the cool ones. Yes, yes, but uh, but as you can see, the hot Jupiter and the cool Jupiter follow the same line, so it does matter. I see. Okay, cool. All right. Well, that was a good question. So, um, uh, there was let me again <laughs> clean up a little so, bit. There we go. go. Did you want to say something, John? Yeah. So the way that he worded his question, it could well be that um, there there is some bias. We are biased toward finding things that are closer into their star. That, that is definitely true. Um, but uh, we're not, it, it's, it's uh, the observational bias shouldn't be um, also a metallicity bias. And so the, the bias there is actually physical. I see. Like it's okay, good. All right. Well, as. Ganio Vitale, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he's uh, asking, as much as a gas giant can reshuffle a system and kick planets out, we've heard about this before, large planets can come in and just sort of make a mess in the system. Uh, can the opposite happen? Could it be possible to explain such compact systems? In other words, can these gas giants, I guess the opposite of kicking them out is to pull them in? Can that happen? Perfect one for Songhu. <laughs> so... Tony, can you repeat this question? Sure. I didn't totally okay, so well, the question is, as much as gas giants can reshuffle a system and kick planets out, you know, they just, they, they, they can move in, they can move out, they can, and, and basically cause all kinds of uh, havoc in a system. Can the opposite happen uh, to explain how we got these compact systems? In other words, I think what he's asking is, can these hot Jupiters or these gas giants move the planets inward? Making them closer to the star. This is an excellent question. This is a, our one of our current explanation of this uh, result. We we think the uh, Jupiter outside Jupiter really perturbs the innermost planets. So if you have a Jupiter outside and you perturb its inner planet and make it. Uh, instable and if the planet is instable you cannot see them right now because uh, they will become instable in their formation history so that's why for system with jupiter they usually have a less uh compact multiple planet system which will increase which will cause this uh, uh metallistic increase so, Sorry, the, 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 the fraction increase to low metallicity. Because, again, because the hot Jupiters just cause a sense of instability? Because they're not there. Oh, the uh, ones that are not there. I see. I'm sorry. I missed that part. So the, the, the systems that are not, the ones that do not have these giant planets in them don't have the instability associated with, uh, that, that, would, that might keep them from getting so close. Right? Mm, that's a, well, you, a, you were mentioning the instability of the system because of the yes. The, so I'm trying yeah. to get my mind around why. So like, not having those systems in there, hot, hot like, Jupiter's. Uh, we we can we can use our solar system as an example. So if our solar system have uh, planets, compact multi-planets inside, not not like uh, our Earth and uh, Venus, but uh, something more compact and more. A little bit more massive, and our Jupiter will perturb them and make make them become unstable, and they will collide with each other and uh, disrupt it. So we will not see them. 
Okay. Does does okay. that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Ocean McIntyre is commenting. Uh, you have to keep in mind that most of the exoplanets that we've identified have been do done through transits. Kepler and now TESS are looking at fast transits. That's true. We see these things going through relatively relatively quickly. He, and finally, Ocean Commenter, Ocean McIntyre is also commenting, in order to find exoplanets similar to those in our system, we need time uh, to look at one system for a very long time. Do you guys agree with that in order to really get a good handle on this? Yeah, most definitely. And uh, we've now had, so despite the fact that most are found due to transits, and that's largely due to the Kepler uh, mission, which is able to stare at so many simultaneously. Which it did for five years, by the way, Ocean Magnetire. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, <laughs> you know, it did look for a good long time there. Um, but uh, but uh, radio velocity searches have been looking for a much longer period of time, but they haven't had the precision to reach down uh, to find planets like the Earth. Uh, uh, so, oh, sorry, so Kep who didn't? Radio velocity searches. Oh, right, right. Okay, sure. That's, um, so, for those of you who don't know, that's where the planets tug on the star and shift the spectrum back and forth, and you that you can you can feel you can infer the existence of those planets by looking at the wobble they induce on the star itself. Um, and so the the current kind of state of the art in that is measuring uh, changes in velocity down to about one meter per second, uh, and uh, for reference, the the Jupiter imparts about 12 meter per second tug on the sun. And to find Jupiter, it would take us about 12 years because that's about how long Jupiter takes to go around the sun. Um, and the Earth, though, uh, imparts only nine and a half centimeter per second oh, signal. Oh, God. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it would take us about a year to find it if we had that precision. Now, it turns out that there's a lot of people now driving toward that precision. Um, there's two spectrographs that are already commissioned and, and observing. One is uh, Espresso uh, down in Chile. That's from That's, the European Space mm -hmm. Agency yeah. or European Southern Observatory. Southern Observatory. Thank right. you. Uh, and Express, which is a, a project that Deborah Fisher started uh, on the Discovery Channel telescope of Lowell Observatory out in Arizona. Ah, oh, okay. So we are reaching toward that level of precision uh, with radial velocity. But we'll need, need some time still, yeah. as he pointed out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, Hans I have a... Uh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I have no, Carol, what are you even doing here? You just keep <laughs> interrupting us. I don't even... Ah. Okay, Carol, go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to return to this uh, presence of a Jupiter or large gas planet in the system. This is not to say that, I think we alluded to this before, that the systems that you're finding could have large gaseous planets, but much um, further out? They could. Uh, and we just don't know yet. We just have no way of knowing. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. And, curious. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you still there? Oh, I think she muted okay. herself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I got to find my cursor. And then once I do, I will ask another question from uh, Hans Milling. Here it is. Hans Milling wants to know um, if our solar system is defined as a compact system. So is our solar system is a compact system? Yes. He, he wants to know if it's classified as what? compact. What we can see is uh, our solar system is relatively compact in the sense that uh, Mercury will leave us eventually. <laughs> Where's it going? <laughs> because in a long, know this. long term, the Mercury will become unstable. In that sense, it's compact. But our solar system is not the same system we found in by, by Kepler mission, we call those compact system because they are compact and close to their host star. Our Mercury is uh, not very close to the host star. So, An, an alternative name that people have used is uh, systems of tightly packed inner planets or tightly inner, systems yeah, of tightly stips. Sti so. Oh, because they wanted to use a... Acronym. Because they want an acronym. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Let's see. Um, just reading some of your comments here, guys. Upcycle Electronics. We need a transit survey with 2,100-day observation windows minimum, as that would be about two to three transits of a Mars-like planet around a Type G star, like the sun. That's true. So good. that's a good observation. Um, what do you guys think of TESS? Is TESS going to help you guys much with these? Because TESS's observation window is um, a couple months, right? And it's going to be looking at one area of sky for a couple months and move on. Um, is it going to help you guys with this much? Yes. yes. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So Song Hu just led a paper where we found uh, a hot Jupiter in, in test data uh, or confirmed a hot Jupiter that was found in the test data using radio velocities. And I think that that's really the way forward is, what TESS is going to be able to do is point out transits to us uh, around these bright stars that we can then follow up with radio velocity over long time periods and really characterize those systems. One thing that was lacking with, with Kepler is bright targets. Um, we looked at mainly stars that were a little further away, and that was hard for ground-based radio velocity follow-up. Um, uh, what TESS is focusing on are the bright stars all over the sky, so all the ground-based resources can start participating in follow-up. Okay, and uh, but TESS was, I mean, Kepler was trying to find the uh, Earth-sized planets anyway, right? So that's it was right. it was kind of specifically designed for that one for that one type of exoplanet. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, where there was, I, my, I'm scrolling through some of my my comments here. Uh, uh, why is the video uh, YouTube video not working? It says the video has been deleted. <laughs> That's because I got that. You had, there's a new link. If you're watching the Facebook, you're watching the right one. So you're there. Don't worry. Uh, you're there. And um, uh, okay, well, let's move on to outside of this. Um, research paper that you've that you've written um what what are your are you going to expand on this some more uh to look because i understand the need to characterize stars around which planets live and you want to know as much as we can about the nature of these stars um obviously because they're so close to the star they're not much in the way of a i'm presuming a habitable uh, habitable zones and all of that crap that you always hear about with exoplanets. These are too close. Am I right? Yeah. So the fact is there a correlate? So I guess I'd like to know where you're going with this research. And also, is there a correlation between a high metal star or a low metal star and its solar activity? In other words, is a low metal star more active than a high metal star? Uh, or are they not even correlated? Um, well, that last one's an excellent question. I don't believe that there's a correlation uh, other than there is a, a difference with age. Uh, do you know, Song Hu? I think there is a slight relation because uh, there is a, a famous relation between the stellar metallicity and the stellar mass. So the, for high metallicity, usually, but not always, have a higher mass and the higher mass star is really younger and more active right so, yeah. so there is a there is a slight, slight correlation, yeah. correlation yes. i mean i can see that there's nothing in your research to preclude the, the, correct me if i'm wrong there being habitable planets outside of these compact areas because of what uh uh these guys have already said in the comments that we need a lot of time to observe right. these transits. We may not have been looking at it long enough. There's there, there could be things outside the plane of the transit right. that we can't see. So there's nothing to preclude there being a planet, the size of earth habitable in the, a system like this, but it right. might preclude any habitability if it's a very active star, uh, which is why I was asking about that. Uh, oh, uh, correlation, yeah. a correlation between. So, uh, so the, the stars that we looked at, we actually focused in on a really narrow subset of all of it. There's, uh, there's a lot more known hosts, planet hosts, than, than, and even planet hosts that I've analyzed their, the spectra of. Uh, but we focused in on these 700-ish uh, because uh, they're uh, kind of middle-aged stars, 
uh, in, a, in a narrow temperature range where we get really good parameters. Uh, so they're very sun-like stars. They're G stars. Um, and uh, so there, the, any, any of that correlation would be weak. It does mean that, yes, most of these compact multi-planet systems are not going to have planets in the habitable zone, although some of them on the, on the outskirts, because they're the smaller end of the G stars, mm -hmm. uh, those would actually fall in the habitable zone as well. Okay. Uh, the, uh, but in, in following up, if we see these, we can then start targeting with radio velocity follow-up and and looking for the further out planets. So that sounds like really the, re the next stage of this research, isn't it? You really want to get some of these radio velocity measurements. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the in fact, th there's a there's a second thing to follow up, which actually relates to plot number two in the paper. Hang on, I'll get it. Um, while you're talking, and that's that. We focused really on the metallicity because that was a, a really nice, clean, and and digestible result, but. Uh, in the second plot, we also plot the ratio of silicon to iron. Okay, I've got it up now. Um, and yes, and Peter so, Q, you can see my my cursor on purpose, so I can point to things. Sorry, <laughs> he was coming. And so uh, I just drew two lines on the plot, and the vertical line there, the dashed gray line, mm -hmm. uh, points out that below that line, you've got no systems that are that are hot Jupiters, and a, an increasing fraction of those stars are blue points. That are the the compact multi-planet systems. Uh, that's just what the the plot above already told us. Um, but you can see that as you go to lower metallicities, most of the stars' silicon to iron ratio starts to increase. So the stars start to sweep up as they go down to the left. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, that's something that we know that's uh, different elements are made from different supernovae, and so you get a, a different mix of of elements uh, in the stars. But if you if you look, there's that horizontal line there that I also drew, and it's also true that none of the points above that line are hot Jupiters, and none of the points above and an and increasing number of stars above that line are are these compact multi-planet systems. And so it could be that the silicon to iron ratio is what's causing this difference and not the, not the iron abundance itself. There actually are stars that have both a high metallicity, high iron abundance, and a high silicon to iron ratio. But they happen to be in part of the galaxy that we don't observe very much when we're looking for planets in the thick disk stars. And so it's possible that if we target those stars, target thick disk stars that have a high silicon to iron ratio, we'd also find these even if they were at high metallicities. Okay, I'm still, I'm still. Uh, so that if you look in the top right quadrant, bisected by the gray line, gray dashed lines. Yeah. Um, it, there's a handful of points there. Right. They're green, uh, green dots that are just known host stars. Right. Uh, they're not hot Jupiters, though. Right. Uh, that's kind of interesting because is, there it more, is it more accurate to say they don't have this? These host stars don't have hot Jupiters. Yeah, they they definitely don't have hot Jupiters. Okay, that's because you say they're not hot Jupiters, and to me that means that they should be uh, that they that the green dot should be replaced by a, uh, a, a, a orange star, but instead they're next to each other. Uh, so the. Um, the orange points would indicate that they had a hot Jupiter around them. Okay. Uh, the green points are something other than a hot Jupiter or a compact multi-planet system. So they're neither one. Okay. Um, but they have planets of some kind around they them. They have planets of some kind, right. Oh, thank you. Okay. That was um, the knot you were talking about earlier. Okay. And, and so it's... so. It could be that we just haven't seen the third planet. Our definition for a compact multi-planet system in this paper was three or more planets and less than an AU uh, orbits. Um, and uh, so it could be that we just didn't see the third one, as the people noted, that uh, uh, you could have had them uh, miss their transits because they're small, uh, or they could have been slightly misaligned. Um, but that seems kind of arbitrary. Three or more planets, less than an AU. Did, was there a reason for that limit? Uh, it was mainly to to select these as compact multi-planet systems. In in 
in reality, most of them were three or more planets and less than about a third of an AU. Um, okay. Uh, with only a few pushing out to the toward the limit. Okay. All right. Well, um, so let me go back to. Uh, I'm trying to do a million things here at once. Where did my cursor go? There it is. Okay. Um, okay. So a couple more questions here. Um, upwards upcycle electronics. Which of the current decadal mission proposals? Oh, this is a good question. Uh, which of the current decadal mission proposals we've talked about? Louvoir, Habex, uh, uh, Lynx, and what's the other one? Origins space uh, telescopes. Which of those proposals will be will best benefit this research, or will none of them? <laughs> um, I am not. Uh, fully up on all the details of all of them. However, I can tell you that I'm I, excited about Louvoir. And uh, Origins would help too. Um, yeah. Because they're designed to look at a lot of these planets uh, like our Earth. And, yeah. And so... But, any... but, but they're, uh, both of them are targeted at the, at the next step, and that's it. Once we find these planets in the habitable zone, we want to start really drilling down on a handful of them to look at their atmospheres and see, do they actually harbor life? Do they have breathable atmospheres? Yeah. Cause we're talking late 2020s, 2030s, if we're lucky for this stuff. So it's, it's all going to be quite a way down the road. What about JWST? Uh, the spectrographs on there in your spec and that kind of stuff. Uh, well, it's like, it's not going to do radio velocity though, is it? Or you're not going to get enough time to be able to do radio velocity on JWST. I'd imagine. Yeah, that that's, it's a, uh, it's a great instrument, but not for long-term follow-up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, capital H. So, as the universe ages, stars tend to become more metal rich. Uh, so, it, with this research, will these planet configurations become more common as time marches on? That's a, that's that's a, a really good question. <laughs> I'm thinking about that going, mm, maybe. That's a very, very, <laughs> very good question. So... As I mentioned before, there is a correlation between the uh, uh, metallicity and the stellar mass. There is also a metallic uh, uh, relation, as uh, uh, you just mentioned, is uh, uh, metallicity and age relation. So far, to determine the age is super super hard. So we can we can't really understand the, the degeneracy between this uh, relation to see if the uh, metallicity relation is caused by, so the relation we saw is caused by age or caused by the really, by the metallicity itself. That's a very good question. Yeah, I yeah. heard, I heard, I heard this question from one of my colleagues as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Hans Milling, does this mean that if we want to find Earth 2.0, we can rule out a lot of systems based on the contents of metals in the host star. Another really good question. <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, just ignore the, hot, the the low metal stars? Actually, uh, I think that uh, if, well, I was about to say, if I was planning a, uh, an observing campaign, but I am a planning an observing campaign. Uh, <laughs> uh, Did you forget? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that can Wait, I gotta, what am I doing here at this hangout? I've got to go. i got to. <laughs> I gotta, gotta go. go. I, actually, <laughs> I actually do have to have my list done by Tuesday when I'm out the telescope. But uh, um, yeah, so one of the things that we're doing, um, we're not so interested in the hot Jupiters anymore. We do have a few in our campaign. Uh, they make nice verification objects. They're easy to find. Um, and so the highest metallicity we probably wouldn't want because you see that uh, there, there, there's such a large fraction of the, the systems that are now hot Jupiters, and maybe we don't want hot Jupiters. We want we want Earth-like systems. Uh, at the very low end, if we're looking around smaller stars, I would target the lower metallicity ones because there we already know that we're likely to get, and even increasingly likely to get, a compact system of multiple planets. And around a smaller star, those could be in the habitable zone. Uh, and so it turns out that that's actually a sweet spot for the new RV. Say we don't reach 10 centimeters per second, we only reach 20 centimeters per second. 
uh, with 20 centimeters per second around uh, a late G or an early K star, we could find these systems. So that would be pretty sweet. Okay, that's uh, great. It also takes us less time to find them since the shorter period orbits are uh, going to be uh, beneficial to funding cycles. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> we have to pay for less time because we have to observe. Oh, them right. Of course. Yeah. yeah because <laughs> these stars that go around take several years to go around their sun. That's expensive. Yeah. I didn't even really think about that. That's a good point. Um, okay. Well, um, boy, you guys really asked some good questions here. Um, I just want to check uh, Facebook to make sure I'm not missing anything there. Um, I see people watching, but we don't have any questions. And finally, I'll look at Twitch, and I don't see things there. Uh, next time, I hope to have the ability, folks, to have Facebook comments show up on the, the uh, Hangout. Um, I bought the software for that. I just need to test it before I implement it. So I'll hopefully next week be able to start. So it'll give you another incentive to uh, comment on Facebook. Um, okay, Carol, do you have any questions? Anything to, that, that that's left? I think we're... Any close to running out of time, so I is there anything that you want to mention? No burning questions at this point. Yes. Okay. Um Oh yes, I do. Um sorry. <laughs> of course. That's the thing about Carol. All I gotta do is just <laughs> just give her a little so, poke. And give it, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about uh stellar activity and the for us non aficionados of exoplanets, there's this big thing about you know, the small M stars and, and active stars and, and uh, that whole discipline of trying to figure out, is it detrimental to, to the formation of life and all that? Um, it, in your samples, have you been able to look at M stars at different metallicities and see an effect or isn't this, there enough of a sample to say anything? Uh, primarily, uh, it's hard. Uh, M stars, in addition <laughs> to being active uh, and dim, they also have uh, their their cool nature means that confusing all of the atomic lines that I like to use to to determine the abundances. There's all these uh, yeah. molecular lines that I don't know. Yeah, uh, and so uh, that doing would be that true. Analysis is a whole other chore. Um, the uh, I'm actually most partly because of this bias, but I'm most excited about the G and K stars. Sure. And I don't have to worry about the Right. And they're most similar to the to the sun and, the, the, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. The cooler stars are kind of a mess. Yeah. So it would be yeah. Okay. okay. Just yeah. curious. I have a, I have a summary thought about uh, our research the the relation between our research and the habitability. I think uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning we really don't know why the short period planets form the, there. How can they reach there? So one thing we want, we really want to know in our research and in many different researches is uh, we want to understand how this planet form and evolve and how this planet's configuration and the relation between this configuration and their stellar property related to our own solar system. I think uh, instead of searching another Earth 2.0, this is another way to approach the question we asked for centuries if our solar system is uh, special. Right. So you're saying that to be able to find out how these early planets or how these inner planets got there is crucial. Uh, because it, it could be that they were once maybe habitable and then moved in, or you don't, we don't know yet, even how these, these systems can get con, uh, in this configuration. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the, the question uh, the community, community really want to answer is why this uh, Kepler discovered planets is so different from our solar system. Right. If yeah, we that's answer true. this question, that's a big step towards to answer the question if our solar system is special. That's true, yeah. Because so much about what we're learning is showing this that we're actually pretty weird. We're not seeing a lot of our solar systems out there. They're seeing a lot of weird stuff uh, yeah. that 
is is sort of getting a, it's very head scratching. You're right about that, and you know we want to be careful about being too anthropic about this. But this is really, I think you're right, an important question. How common are these things? You guys looked at 700 stars, found a fraction of them behaving with these, you know, having these compact systems uh, with the correlation of their st- with their star type that they were low metal stars. Uh, but that doesn't really say much about how they got there, does it? It just is like, how did this thing even form? So people, I think, looking at protoplanetary systems, protoplanetary disks, uh, watching these, I think, would be important, right? Wouldn't that be something that would help us understand what you're talking about? I think I think so. One most important uh, implication of our work is to help the theorists to, to understand how this planet form, because of basically speaking, from from planets is like uh, from a uh, snowball, snowball, and uh, naively thinking you can you can imagine if uh, you have a metal rich disk and. Uh, you have a more material, you can more easily to form the planet. And surprisingly, that's not the case in our sample. I see. Wow. Okay. Well, we will leave it there. I hope that you guys can continue this work. I look forward to you guys getting better um, resolution on your radio velocity measurements. Uh, uh, right now, TESS is it for the transit world. So you've got your te- you've got all the ca- transit data you're going to get for a while, <laughs> unless yeah. you we're doing it. Are we doing this from the ground anywhere? These transit surveys? Yeah, there are a lot of ground-based transit surveys, but uh, the atmosphere plays havoc with it and limits yeah. the size planet that they typically can find. Yeah, so that's another example of something that's really done ideally in space. And radio velocity is good from the ground as well uh, because you get more time. It's not as expensive as a space telescope dedicated to looking at one star for a very long time. So uh, good. Well, here's hoping that that happens quickly. And good luck on your observing run, John. Thank I you. Hope, hope you show up because I'm a little worried now. You know, you might, you know. <laughs> so I'm just just giving you our time. Uh, I just want to put out one plug. So Carol mentioned uh, Deborah Fisher. She was yes. actually my advisor at Yale and is still my uh, my boss now as I work on uh, on Express and the Hundred Earths project that we're doing there. But the fourth author on our paper was Dan Foreman Mackey, who helped us oh, yeah. uh, okay. verify our statistics. He's uh, here at the Flatiron Institute in New York. Yeah. Okay. Good. Need a shout out there. Hey, you know, you did you guys know that I was a postdoc at Yale? Oh no! Awesome. Oh <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, I taught yeah. the the intro astronomy class long time. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, one year. <laughs> oh, that's cool. awesome, Carol. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Was interesting. <laughs> but two hundred. Two hundred and thirty students in semester one. I know. Oh boy. <laughs> my son. Yeah. My son's in the in the physics program at CU, and he's in one class of about I think one hundred and fifty uh, for his well, physics one hundred and one. So I don't know if they still use that classroom, but it's down on the main on the old campus, and it had all those student desks, and they were all wooden, and they were all old. <laughs> and so two hundred and thirty people sitting in the room, constantly moving, yeah. little squeaks, and it's like. Really, all the money Yale's got, and they got these squeaky old wooden <laughs> no, chairs. Like, oh my god! Well, the second semester was taught actually in a in a a much smaller theater type uh, room, which was much more <laughs> conducive to learning. Yes. <laughs> that 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 old classroom was amazing, and the floor was wooden too, right? So any scraping, <laughs> yes. moving, shuffling, dropping, you know, squeaking, it was oh, it's a nightmare. Uh, anyway. Very true. Well, okay. Good times. Good times. <laughs> All right, you guys. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you both very much for uh, for joining thank us. You. Uh, you guys watching, you. you need to use Discord more. It's right here in front of me, and I just got something from Hans Miller. Someone is asking if you could post a link to the paper a few days before the hangout for people to be able to read them before the video. I think it is a great idea. It's a possible. great idea, but come on, people. We're astronomers. We're just in time. <laughs> Guess when I got a link to the paper? John doesn't even have his observing list yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. And I got the paper. That's not how we operate. <laughs> at 2.50. No, okay? He wants to take advantage of the best possible conditions for the best possible list. Yeah. So. I'd love to. I will try harder. Uh, but when we're wrangling these astronomers, they're busy people. And so they can't, they can't always. Uh, and we decide like while we're setting up, oh, do you have a paper? Yeah, sure. Oh, can I show this graphic? Oh, yeah. Now you want to show the graphic. Okay. Well, let me just get set up. So, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's how it works here. At that's the, how it uh, always the is the last 15 minutes. <laughs> that's right. Oh. All right, folks, that is it for this Hangout. Thank you all so much. I want to thank our guests, John Brewer from Yale and uh, and Sanghu uh, Wang, also from Yale, the, the, they, uh, who wrote the paper, presented uh, their research on the correlation between compact uh, uh, planetary systems and uh, low metallicity stars. Thank you both so much for being with us. And we yeah, hope thank get you. more get more cool stuff. Come back and talk to us about it. You're always welcome. And sure. hey, thank you. Yeah, and on behalf of Carol Christian, uh, I want to thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Thank you. Thanks. See you.